Welcome back to Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Keppel, and I'm very glad you've joined me today. This is our 10th episode and possibly final episode of this series looking at Presbyterian history, theology, confessions, and controversies. As we swing through all of these interesting places, we can't stay too long in any one place. So if you have questions or comments or anything of the sort, please leave a comment below or ask your pastor who can give you much more in-depth resources than we can in this space here. Last week, we took a trip by the mothership in Louisville, looking at the early days of the Presbyterian Church USA, this time with parentheses. <laughs> this week, we're heading to Sarasota, Florida, for a look at what's next in the church. But while we're waiting, let's take a look at the newest confession, added in 2016, but written in 1986 in South Africa. The Belhar Confession is closely tied with the history of apartheid in South Africa and with colonialism and slavery as it all ties together. The Khoikhoi, San, Bantu, and Zulu peoples all called the region home for hundreds of years before the Portuguese, Dutch, and English came and colonized the Cape, wanting at first just to have a location to restock their ships. The Dutch decided to settle the region in order to provide for their ships, and they enslaved local populations, as well as bringing in indentured servants and slaves from their colonies in Indonesia uh, and elsewhere in Africa. Additionally, they were joined by the French Huguenots and German Protestants who were fleeing religious persecution in Europe. All of these disparate peoples ended up creating a creole, today known as Afrikaans, though at the time it was just seen as a bad dialect of Dutch. In the 19th century, Britain imposed an English-only rule on their colonies and proceeded to try to unify the South African colonies under their rule by force and simultaneously outlaw slavery. Although initially unsuccessful, they did succeed in driving many of the Afrikaans-speaking people out into unsettled territory causing a few short-lived independent republics to form before the British expanded again, eventually taking control of the entire region. Under British rule, a new influx of peoples, including Indians uh, from the subcontinent of Asia, came to the region. The white Afrikaners chafed under British rule and after the Second World War, organized into a national party that instituted a racist policy of apartheid meaning separation between whites and blacks. Under the rules set up as a British colony and later retained as an independent colony, only whites could vote in elections, and white Afrikaners were the majority of whites in the country. Despite lobbying and pacifist demonstrations inspired by Gandhi, the apartheid rules became harsher, and black South Africans could not vote to change them. These policies affected not only the secular world, but also the church as well, as black and white Christians were not allowed to worship together. The Belhar Confession emerged out of this, pushing back against apartheid and offering theological justification for unity. Like the Barman Declaration, it states positives and rejects negatives, those negatives being the status quo of separation. For example, uh, we believe that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, and therefore also the powers of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity, that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. Therefore, we reject any doctrine which, in such a situation, sanctions in the name of the gospel or of the will of God the forced separation of people and the grounds of race and color, and thereby in advance obstructs and weakens the ministry and experience of reconciliation in Christ. In 1991, the policies of apartheid finally ended and the way was paved for the first open election in South Africa just three years later. No longer forced to remain separate, the churches of South Africa were able to unite and worship together. While reformed churches around the world started adopting the Confession of Belhar soon thereafter, the story in the PCUSA is a little bit more involved. Um, it was held up by the debates around LGBTQ rights 
though it was eventually added to the Book of Confessions in 2016, 50 years after it had been written. These debates around LGBTQ rights in the church had been playing out in the church since the 1990s in a major way, causing the denomination to focus internally for around 20 years. With the exodus of the Evangelical Covenant Order in 2010, spurred on by the PCUSA allowing and recognizing the ordination of LGBTQ people, the denomination realized that it needed to shift the focus outwards again. In 2012, General Assembly called for 1,001 new worshiping communities to be formed and supported by the presbyteries around the country. New, as in seeking to make and form new disciples of Jesus Christ, taking on varied forms of church for our changing culture. Worshiping, meaning that these communities need to gather for word and sacrament and be sent out by the Spirit to join in the transformation of the world. And community, placing and practicing mutual care and accountability while developing sustainability in leadership and finances. These new worshiping communities varied widely from one to the next. In some cases, they were closer to traditional churches, but in others, they were like house churches or coffee shops with Sunday worship, or even athletes who ran marathons together and took communion at the finish line. Though the new worshiping community initiative is due to end in 2022, hopefully it will spur new innovation in what it means to be a part of the Presbyterian Church. Lastly, we come to the reason that we are in Sarasota for this episode. In January of 2017, eight Presbyterians felt called to respond to the ideological and theological division within the church uh, with the creation of a new statement of faith. As they wrote then, we encourage groups of Presbyterians in a rich and colorful diversity of relationships, both within and beyond congregations, to conceive and declare their own faith statements, proclaiming the light of Christ. In other words, instead of being a statement of faith written at the request of the denomination, this was a statement written to address particular issues at a particular time. The Sarasota statement was presented publicly at a Presbyterian conference called Next Church in 2017 and was revisited in 2020 with a new prologue. This new prologue states specifically, we have the obligation to confess faith in God by standing against racism, imperialism, and any thought, action, or policy that denies the dignity and humanity of God's children and the sanctity of the planet. We reaffirm the gospel truth that we are one family in God's household. No one is an outsider or stranger. We pray not simply for decency and belonging, but for also value restored, voices amplified, legacies renewed, and livelihoods revived. People of every gender, culture, and identity have the right to integrity over their bodies. The Sarasota Statement is emblematic of what the future of the Presbyterian journey might be, filled with bold prophetic words and actions to back them up. The church is very much not at an end, but is experiencing a new rebirth in the radical love of God, asking forgiveness for past mistakes and walking a path of reconciliation into the future. Righteous anger at injustice is strong in the church, and so are people with the God-given intelligence and charisma to help us make our way into God's path. Whether or not the Sarasota Statement is ever adopted as an official confession of the Church, it shows that the Spirit is leading us forward into making these sorts of statements. I encourage you to think deeply about your beliefs and perhaps write up your own statement of faith, what you believe, influenced by the Bible, the confessions, and your own life trajectory. Thank you for joining me on this look into the Presbyterian journey. I am grateful for the ability to share this history with you and to know that God is active in your life. May your journey be blessed to be a blessing, and may you be led by the Spirit every step along the way. Amen. <laughs>